Hi everybody, welcome to Dr. Manny's YouTube Learn Shops. Today we're going to be discussing human dynamics, social and emotional development in infancy and childhood, both two important areas in behavioral sciences. Now, theory of psychosocial development, according to Erickton, was that he maintained that personality develops in a predetermined order. And it's through this predetermined order, which consists of eight stages, psychosocial development occurs. And he states from infancy all the way through to adulthood. And during each of his stages that he recommends, the person experiences some sort of crisis, a psychosocial crisis, which can have a positive or a negative outcome for the development of their personality. Now, the stages of psychosocial development are, as you can see, as follows, which we'll be looking at. And you've got here, stage one, from birth to two years of age, which is called trust versus mistrust. Two to three years of age, autonomy versus shame or doubt. Four to five years of age, the initiative or the guilt stage. Six to 11 years, industry versus inferiority. Adolescence, identity versus confusion. Adulthood or young adulthood, intimacy versus isolation. Middle adulthood, generivity versus stagnation, and in late adulthood, integrity versus despair. We'll be reviewing each of these stages of development. We have reviewed other psychologists and sociologists like Freud and Maslow. Erickson believed personality developed in a specific set order and always built upon a previous stage. He called it the epigenetic principle. And this is how genes are influenced by life experiences, which can exert a profound, long lasting influence on both physical and mental health throughout our lives. Erickson proposed that there were eight stages for psychosocial development. And each stage was the consequence of some sort of psychosocial crisis. And if they passed that stage or didn't pass that stage, it would affect a basic virtue. So that for the first stage, trust versus mistrust, if they established that stage, hope was established. If they didn't, they lost hope. In stage two, autonomy or independence versus shame. If it was established, then the basic virtue, virtue of will, willpower, was established. If it wasn't established here, they would not have the will to achieve anything. In stage three, you have initiative versus guilt. And if you establish this stage, you would develop the virtue of purpose. You'd have a purpose to what you were trying to achieve in your life. And look how early it starts, three to five years of age. Childhood development is a very essential component of becoming a healthy, positive, productive adult. Stage four, industry versus inferiority. Industry basically means you're in industrious, you're positive. 
you produce. And if you achieve that, you become competent. If you don't achieve it, you become incompetent. Then you've got ego identity versus role confusion. And fidelity is true to yourself. So you establish your identity as what you are, male, female, where you want to go in life, otherwise you have role confusion. This is to do with adolescence. Then you've got stage six, intimacy versus isolation. Are you alone or do you have a companion? The basic virtue is that you establish a loving relationship. Then you've got generativ gener generativity or generation, generating something versus stagnation, meaning you're not really doing anything. Generativity means that you are still producing. Stagnation means that you're not. This is stage five. And if you achieve this here, then the basic virtue is related to care. Someone cares about you. You care about things. You care about your life. And the final stage, ego integrity versus despair. And the basic virtue is wisdom. What did you learn in your life? What did you achieve? Was it good? Something that is to do with integrity and makes you feel good, your ego. Different ego compared to what Freud spoke about, which we spoke about in the previous session. Or did your life not account for anything? Despair. So the eight stages are trust versus mistrust. This will achieve the basic virtue of hope. Autonomy versus shame means that you have established your will in what you want to do. Initiatives versus guilt provides you with a purpose in your life. Industry versus inferiority, are you competent? Ego identity versus role confusion. Fidelity is to do with truthfulness. You know where you're going. Intimacy and isolation. Are you in a loving relationship? Are you loved? Generivity versus stagnation. Are you caring? Have you generated something in your life? Ego intensity, sorry, ego integrity versus despair is related to wisdom. As you reflect, this is a reflection, reflecting on your life. And when you reflect on your life, you may say, gee, I did achieve quite a lot. Or, boy, I've had a terrible life. I haven't really done anything with it. It's come and gone so quickly. So let's look at Ericsson's eight stages. And you have to know these. And you, some of you know, all of you will be presenting some component of this. Stage one. Trust versus mistrust. Remember that the infant is uncertain about the world in which they live and looks primarily to their caregiver for stability and consistency of care. That's typically their mother. And you can reflect this with Maslow as well. And it'll carry them into other relationships. If the care has been consistent, or inconsistent, predictable or unpredictable, reliable or unreliable, then the infant may develop a sense of mistrust or develop trust or suspicion or anxiety. In this situation, the infant won't have any confidence in the world around them or their abilities to influence their own events. So stage one, trust or mistrust, that's a continuum, remember from typically birth to about two years of age. The features are trust. It requires basic needs to be met. 
such as physical comfort, warmth, reassurance. Think of Maslow. The outcome, if care is consistent, predictable, reliable, the infant trusts you. They'll feel secure. If mistrust develops because of a failure to provide basic needs, they're hungry, they're dirty, they're in pain. If the care has been inconsistent, unpredictable, unreliable, then the infant may develop a sense of mistrust and suspicion and anxiety. If it's successful, this will lead to the virtue of hope. Hope is an important element in everybody. We always hope for the best. Then you've got stage two. Stage two is autonomy versus shame or doubt. Autonomy is a belief in yourself. Independence. Shame, I've just put the word doubt to make it clearer. Typically from about 18 months to three years. And the features are developing a sense of autonomy, independence. If there's a positive outcome, if it's encouraged and supported, the infant becomes more confident and secure in their own abilities. Negative outcomes, if they're criticized or not given the opportunity to assert themselves, they'll begin to feel inadequate. They'll become very dependent on others. Their self-esteem will suffer. There'll be a sense of shame or doubt in their abilities. If it's successful in this stage, it will lead to the will or the virtue of will, which essentially is motivation. They'll be motivated to achieve more. What happens during this stage? For example, toilet training makes toddlers learn the beginning of self-control, control their bodily functions. They learn about assertion. They can simply say the word no. Or they may state, well, gee, I'm independent. I can do it myself. Or they want to choose their own toys. They don't need you to be the one that does it for them. Stage three, initiative versus guilt. Typically between three and five years of age, the features are these kids are becoming more responsible, more assertive, more confident. They regularly interact with other kids at school and they learn from them. And they initiate activities with others. Positive outcomes, if it's encouraged, children develop a sense of initiative and they feel secure in their own decisions. Negative outcome, if suppressed or controlled by, by criticism, the children develop a sense of insecurity, possibly guilt. Success during this stage will lead to the virtue of purpose, while failure results in a sense of guilt. Purpose in what they do, failure, guilt. They don't want to do it. Cautions in this stage are, one, the child will often overstep what is allowable. The risk is that the parents may punish the child and restrict their initiatives too much. You're being too hard on them. Two, the child will begin to ask many questions as their thirst for knowledge grows. The risk is that parents treat the child's questions as being trivial, a nuisance, a pest, or embarrassing, or silly. Then the child may have feelings of guilt for being a nuisance to their parents, or their parents not caring about them. Too much guilt may inhibit their creativity. Some guilt absolutely is necessary, otherwise the kid isn't going to know how to learn to exercise self-control and have judgments, moral or ethical. There has to be some sort of punishment when they do something wrong. It's a balance between initiative and guilt that is important. A 
balance is required. Then you've got the stage of industry versus inferiority, typically occurring between the ages of 5 and 12 years. And the features are, teachers have got a really important role as they teach the child specific skills such as reading, writing. Peer groups absolutely become important for self-esteem. And this is where they demonstrate skills that are valued by society. Society values literacy. Society values intelligence. Society values compliance, rules, regulations. A positive outcome if encouraged and reinforced for their initiative, they begin to feel competent and confident in their ability to achieve goals societal goals. Negative outcome, if they're not encouraged, then the child feels inferior, downing their abilities and may not reach their potential, their full potential. Success in this stage leads to the virtue of competence. Failure, incompetence. Points to remember, if the child cannot develop a specific skill, they may feel society is demanding. For example, look at athletics. If they're not athletic, then they may develop a sense of inferiority. Some failure may be necessary so that a child can develop some form of modesty. And look. Failure, from my perspective, is experience. You fail at something, you learn from it. You pick yourself up and you try again. The important thing is to try and try and try again until you succeed. Again, it's a balance between competence and modesty that's necessary. Stage five, this is identity versus role confusion. And stage five typically occurs between the ages of 12 and 18. And the features are pubescent adolescents want to fit into society. They explore personal values, beliefs, goals. Erickson suggested that there were two identities that were involved. And these were sexual and occupational. And sexual is to do with your gender, who you are. And occupational is what you want to achieve in your life, career possibly. Positive outcomes, if successful, they learn their adult roles, which involves independence in terms of future career, relationships and families. Negative outcome, if unsuccessful, they fail to establish a sense of identity within society, role confusion or identity crisis. And this can establish a negative identity and being melancholic. We looked at the personality for melancholia earlier on. Introverts. You've all just gone through this phase, stage. You're all over 18 years of age. Success in this stage leads to the virtue of fidelity consistency, truth. It's the basis for reliable thought, reason, morality, trust and loyalty. Fidelity is truthfulness to yourself. Consistency. Then you've got intimacy versus isolation. And typically this occurs between the ages of 18 and 40 years of age, which you're all going through or going to experience. The features are to form intimate, loving relationships with other people. It doesn't mean sexual, I mean loving relationships. And this leads to longer term commitments 
with someone other than a family member. The positive outcome, if successful, you're going to be happy in your relationship and have a sense of commitment. You'll feel safe and cared about within that relationship. Think of Maslow again. Negative outcomes, if unsuccessful, there are concerns about commitments, which can lead to loneliness, being alone, isolation, and sometimes depression. If you're successful in this stage, this will lead to the virtue of being loved. If not, unloved. Then you've got stage seven, generivity versus stagnation. And typically this occurs between the ages of 40 and 65 years of age. And this features making your mark on the world. What did you create? What did you nurture? Things that will last longer than you when you pass. This is often creating positive changes that will benefit other people. And it doesn't have to be the world. It could be you and your family, your son, your daughter, your nephews, your nieces, people that you've taught because you're a teacher, people that you've helped. The positive outcome, if successful, leads to feelings of usefulness and accomplishment. You've generated something, generivity. If there's a negative outcome, if it's been unsuccessful, by failing to find a way to contribute, we become stagnant, unproductive. We feel we haven't achieved anything. Success at this stage will lead to the virtue of care, that you've cared about something. See? It could be a grandmother. She's raised her daughter. She's got two lovely grandkids. She's had a productive life. You wrote a book. You're world famous. People know about you. You've generated a piece of literature that children love. Adults love. You've done nothing. You've generated nothing. You'll probably die nothing. Stage eight. Ego, integrity versus despair. Typically, 65 years until you die. The features are people contemplate their own life cycle as something they had to be, a sense of accomplishedness, a sense of completeness. Did you do something with your life? A positive outcome, if successful, enables the person to look back on their life with a sense of pride, closure, completeness, and accept death without fear. I've led a good life. And it doesn't have to be something fantastic. Look at the um, the, 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 the female in the picture. She's still working at whatever age. Let's say she's 70. Yeah, she might dye her hair, but she's working. A negative outcome, if unsuccessful, they see their lives as unproductive. They feel guilty. They've got re regrets about their past or they feel that they didn't accomplish anything in their life. And often this may lead to depression, hopelessness, God willing, not suicide. Success at this stage will lead to the virtue of wisdom. Old people are typically very wise. They've learnt a lot in their life. So, let's revise. These are eight stages of psychosocial development which you are all going to have to be familiar with in your assessments, in your life. Trust versus mistrust. This stage begins at birth, lasts about 18 months. 
the infant develops a sense of trust when the interactions provide reliability, care and affection. Failure, mistrust. Autonomy versus shame. This stage begins at 18 months and lasts through to about three years of age. The infant develops a sense of personal control over physical skills and a sense of independence. Success leads to feelings of autonomy. Failure results in feelings of shame and doubt. Initiative versus guilt. This stage begins at three years and typically ends at five years of age. The child begins to assert themselves and control over their environment and starts accomplishing tasks and faces challenges. Encouragement leads to a sense of purpose, criticism and over control develops a sense of guilt. Industry versus inferiority. This stage begins at five years and typically goes through to about 12 years of age. The child is coping with new skills, learning, social demands. The child's peer group will gain greater significance and become a major source for the child's self-esteem. Success leads to a, fa to a sense of accomplishment and confidence, while failure results in inferiority, feelings of incompetence. Identity versus role confusion. This stage begins typically at 12 years of age to about 18 years of age. This is where teenagers explore who they are. They seek to establish a sense of self. They may experiment with different roles, activities, behaviours. The process is of forming a strong identity and developing a sense of direction in their life where they're going, what they want to be, who they are. Then you've got stage six, intimacy versus isolation, and typically begins at 18 years to 14 years of age. And this is where you form intimate, loving relationships with other people. Success leads to a strong relationship, while failure leads to loneliness and isolation. Stage 7. Generivity versus stagnation. This stage begins at 40 years of age typically and ends at approximately 65 years of age. This is where you establish whether you've made your mark in the world according to what you think is important. Creating positive changes that will benefit other people. And it doesn't have to be the global community, it could be, as I said, your family members. I mean, your role may have been as a mother and you were a fantastic mother and now you're an incredible grandmother. Success leads to feeling useful and accomplishment. Failure results in stagnant and feeling unproductive. Ego integrity versus despair. This is the stage that begins at 65 years of age till you die. And it's reflecting on one, one's life and moving into feeling either satisfied or not satisfied. Happy with your life, not happy with your life. If you have regrets, it's sad. Happy with your life, unhappy with what you've done. Okay, now let's review and discuss parenting behavioural styles, which have an influence on social and emotional development. Reflect on your own parents. Reflect on yourself if you are a parent. And it doesn't have to be just your kids, it could be your nephews or your nieces, which again, you play a parenting role. So what's a parenting style? Well, it's a specific practice or behavior that a parent uses in raising a child or children. You've typically got four, 
you've got the authoritative, authoritarian, permissive, and neglectful parenting styles. There are two dimensions to parenting behaviour. And these consist of what is called demandingness and responsiveness. Demandingness basically means the extent that parents control their children's behaviour or demand their maturity. So they control and they demand. Responsiveness is the degree parents are accepting and sensitive to their children's emotional and developmental needs. Demandingness, control and demand. Responsiveness, accepting and sensitive. Now, parenting styles, according to Diana Borenrind, who is a developmental psychologist and is really well known for her research on parenting styles and ethics in psychological research. And in her work, she identified three primary styles of parenting. She was based at the University of California in the Institute of Human Development. And her three styles were authoritarian, where you're being really too hard. Permissive, you're being too soft. Authoritative, you're just right. There's a balance between the two. There's her model, where you've got four, but she didn't include neglectful. That came later. So you've got the continuum, warm and accepting, cold and unaccepting, demanding, undemanding. And here, for example, the authoritative parenting is warm and accepting, but has certain demands. Authoritarian is cold and unaccepting, and also has demands. Permissive is warm and accepting, but undemanding. Neglectful is cold and unaccepting and undemanding. So let's review them. There's your authoritative. It creates a positive relationship and enforces rules. But we'll be looking at these again. Then you've got authoritarian. The focus is on you will do it my way. Obedience, punishment, over discipline. Then you've got permissive. You just let them do what you want to do. And your explanation is, oh look, kids will be kids. You don't enforce any rules. Then you've got neglectful, you couldn't care less. You provide little guidance, nurturing or attention. So when we review authoritative, this is also called democratic parenting. There's high demandiveness and there's high responsiveness. And the standards basically are that the parents have got rules and they do have use of consequences. They validate their children's feelings and opinions, which means they listen to their kids. They're warm, they're nurturing parents. They use positive discipline strategies to reinforce good behavior like praise and reward systems. And they make it clear that the adults are ultimately in charge, not the children. What are the outcomes? The children become socially responsible adults. They feel comfortable in expressing their opinions. 
They tend to be happy and successful and they fit into society. They are competent social members. When we look at authoritarian, this is also referred to as disciplinarian parenting. There's a high demandingness from the parent, but a low responsiveness. The standards consist of being strict with discipline. The parents are known for saying, because I said so, you do it my way or else there'll be consequences. They're not interested in negotiating and the focus is on obedience from the child. They make rules and enforce the consequences with no regard for the child's opinion. They make the, fear, they make the child feel devalued, unimportant, bad. What are the outcomes for the children? They tend typically to be unhappy and become aggressive. They're not very independent. They possess low self-esteem. They're insecure. They exhibit more behavioral problems than other children. They perform worse academically and they've got poor social skills. They're prone to mental issues such as drug use and have problems. I think also they're the bullies in the world. They're the bullies. Then you've got permissive parenting, which is also referred to as indulgent pairing, parenting. And this is a, as a consequence of low demandingness and high responsiveness. The standards are they take on more of a friend role than a parent role. The parents set very few rules or boundaries. They're reluctant to enforce any rules. They adopt the attitude of kids will be kids. They don't like to disappoint their children. They think their child will learn best with little interference from them. The child is supposed to learn by themselves. The outcomes are for the children, they're not academically very good. They can't follow rules. They've got poor self-control. They've got low self-esteem. They possess egocentric tendencies, which means they only think about themselves. They have problems in health, relationships and social interaction. Then you've got neglectful parenting, which is called uninvolved parenting as well. There's low demand, Thingness, there's low responsiveness from the parent. The standards, the parents don't set form boundaries or high standards. They're indifferent to their children's needs. They really couldn't care less. They expect children to raise themselves and they're often uninvolved in their lives. However, it isn't always intentional. Some of these parents have got their own problems, sometimes mental issues. The outcomes for the children are that they're more impulsive. They're unhappy. They've got low self-esteem. They struggle academically. They're delinquents, which means they break the law. They have addiction problems. Could be drugs, alcohol. There are mental health issues such as suicidal behaviour. It's sad. A lot of children commit suicide. So, let's review. What are the four parenting styles and what do they imply? Authoritative parenting. Authoritarian parenting, permissive parenting, neglectful parenting. They are the four parenting styles. Authoritative means democratic. The child has a voice. They're cared about. They are treated justly, fairly. Authoritarian parenting, this is disciplinarian. The child has no voice 
and they're treated unfairly and typically not cared about. Permissive pairing, permissive parenting, also known as indulgent parenting. Parents have got a very easy going approach, laissez faire, which means laid back, easy going. Neglectful parenting, uninvolved or disinterested, don't really care. Okay, I want you to think, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to come up with the correct answer, I don't think. Which parenting style? do you think is best and why? I'll count to five. One, two, three, four, five. According to the research, authoritative parenting is considered the best. But you've got to remember, parents don't usually just fit into one category. They can be permissive and authoritative, which is probably good, but authoritarian or neglectful is probably bad. Now let's look at Lawrence Kohlberg's moral reasoning theory. Now Lawrence Kohlberg, he was an American psychologist and he's best known for his theory of stages of moral development. And he served as a professor in the psychology department at the University of Chicago and at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University. A brilliant man, but he died, very sad, at the age of 59. And it was suspected that he committed suicide. Everybody has got problems. Anyway, as I said, he was known for his theory of moral development. And in the stages of moral development, there were three levels that he advocated for. Pre-conventional, conventional and post-conventional morality, which we'll discuss. Okay, before we move on, we've got to reflect and discuss what morality is. Morality is basically you, your philosophy on what's right and wrong. Their personal or cultural values, codes of conduct from a society and they're accepted by you, the individual. I mean, we have nursing codes of conduct, regulations, rules that we follow so that we're safe practitioners the guidelines that you can use to determine what you ought to do in a particular situation. It allows you to discern whether a decision or action is right or wrong. It helps people to be law abiding and treat others in society with dignity and respect. It's about ethics and ethics is the philosophical study of morality. You're supposed to perform ethical practices as a nurse. You're supposed to have morals and do the right thing. Okay, moral development then involves changes with age in thought, feelings, behaviors regarding principles and values that guide people, you, what to do. And it commences in childhood, as we saw when we went through this through Erickson's stages of development, psychosocial development, and it continues in a, into adulthood. Human beings are shaped to acquire values, beliefs, and thinking patterns that guide responsible behavior. Kohlberg's theory proposes that there are three levels and that there are six stages to moral development. Now, this is just an overview of Kohlberg's theory. Some of you will be presenting Kohlberg's theory and you can go into whatever detail you choose. Now, Kohlberg 
had six stages grouped into three levels. Level one, he termed pre-conventional morality, which occurs between the ages of three and seven years. And in stage one, this is referred to as punishment, avoidance and obedience. In stage two, you've got individualism and exchange. Then you've got level two, which is conventional morality. Everybody does it between the ages of eight to 13 years of age. And this is stage three, where you have good interpersonal relationships. Stage four, where you abide by the laws and the order of the, of the laws. Then you've got level three, which is referred to as post-conventional morality. You're an adult. And in stage five, you have a social contract. You do what society says. And in stage six, there's a universal ethical principle, which means everybody does it. Three levels, six stages to Kohlberg's theory on moral development. Kohlberg has a triangle too. Six stages, three levels. Level one, pre-conventional, three to seven years of age. This is moral reasoning based on reward and punishment. And as you can see in the pyramid, this is based on self-interest and avoiding punishment. Level two, conventional. Eight to 13 years of age, this is about moral reasoning and it's based on external ethics or principles. And this is to do with law and order being a good person attitude. Then you've got level three, post-conventional, you're an adult. And this is moral reasoning based on personal ethics. Your social contract, or you do what society tells you, and it's based on principles related to society. Your principles as well, in relation to what you believe. Level one, in more detail, pre-conventional morality. Three to seven years of age, moral thinking is guided by the consequences of what you do. Punishment, reward, or an exchange of favors. For example, a child might reason, they shouldn't take the toy in the shop without permission because they could get into trouble, avoiding punishment. Or if they ask nicely to get the toy, the parent might buy it for them, self-interest or reward. In level one, we said three to seven years, moral reasoning, stage one, I do it so I don't get into trouble. Punishment avoided. Stage two, I do it so I get something out of it, a reward. That's their thinking in relation to morality, pre-conventional. Then you go into conventional. Typically between eight and 13 years of age, Moral reasoning is based on a desire to please others or follow the accepted rules and regulations, authority and values. For example, a child, teenager, might reason they shouldn't steal or shoplift because people will think they're a thief, avoiding disapproval. Or, although they cannot afford the item, it doesn't justify stealing. Everyone has to obey the law. Traditional morality of authority. So with conventional morality, level two, moral reasoning is guided by stage three. I do it so people will like and accept me. I want people to like and accept me. Or stage four, and stage four, 
I respect the law. I do it because it is the law. Then you've got level three. Post-conventional morality. You're an adult. Moral behavior is based on self-chosen principles, which could be local, comprehensive, or universal. There's a high value on justice, dignity, and equality. So for example, an employer, sorry, an unemployed poor father steals food because his family is starving. A moral person might say he can steal the food, but then he's got to tell people, he's got to tell the police that he's done so. He'll face the penalty, but he's helped his family. Self-chosen ethical principles. In level three, post-conventional morality, the moral behavior is based on stage five, I do it because of the social contract we have with each other, which means society says yes or no. Stage six, I do it because it's the right thing to do. You've got to decide what the right thing to do. It's an individual choice. What's the right thing to do? Let my family starve or get them food and suffer the consequences. I put this I put this here primarily I don't know whether any of you have ever read the book or seen the movie. It's called A Time to Kill. An incredible movie. I, I think uh, if you ever get the opportunity to watch it. Essentially what happens, you can see the picture there, you've got the father, Afro-American, carrying his daughter. The wife is following, their family is behind them. What's just happened to the little girl is that she was, and again, I think she was only seven in the movie. The little girl was raped, beaten, left for dead by two white, what they call American rednecks. Very unintelligent, um, uneducated people. She was raped, beaten, thrown over a cliff, left for dead. She's seven. She survived. She climbed out of the canyon, crawled to a road. I won't tell you all the things that happened to her by these terrible two men. She was found. She was taken home. This is America. Negroes aren't thought of very nicely, certainly not in that era. However, she survived. She was taken to hospital. The father, carrying the daughter there, went to the court case because these two men, white, were taken to the court and they were probably going to be set free. However, the father knew that and he was waiting in the courthouse hiding with a gun and as the two were being taken to be released he came out and he shot them both and killed them both he was taken to jail and I won't take you tell you the rest of the story but the point was did he do the right thing or did he do the wrong thing? He murdered two men because he knew that they would be freed. And his little girl, she was going to die, but she didn't die, she survived. However, she would never ever be able to have children because of the damage that was caused inside. Psychologically, I'm sure she'll be damaged as well moral reasoning. However, I'll no, I won't tell you the end of the movie, just in case you ever go to see it. A Time to Kill. Moral Reasoning. 
Okay, <clears throat> this is another thing to think about, which Kohlberg stated in 1981. This is called the Heinz Dilemma. And the Heinz Dilemma basically was in Europe, there was a woman who was dying from a rare kind of cancer. There was only one drug that the doctors thought might save her, a rare form of radium that a pharmacist in the same town had recently discovered. But the drug was really expensive and the pharmacist mercenary was charging 10 times what the drug, drug cost him to make. It cost him approximately 200 US, but he charged 2000 for one dose of the drug. The dying woman's husband, Heinz, went to everybody he knew to borrow the money, but he could get only 1000 which was half the cost of the drug. He told the pharmacist that his wife was dying and begged him to sell it to him cheaper or let him pay for it later. But the pharmacist said, no, I discovered the drug and I'm gonna make some money from it. So Heinz got desperate. He broke into the pharmacist's store to steal a drug for his wife. Moral reasoning. Should Heinz, the husband, have done that? The wife, the husband. His wife's dying. He doesn't want her to die. There's a drug that could save her. What is Heinz's dilemma? You think about it. I may post some questions here after this session. Should Heinz steal the drug? You have to decide. Who thinks he should steal the drug and why? Who thinks he should not steal the drug and why? Who can't decide what he should do? Why? I think I probably will post this as a discussion following this lecture. So the evaluation of the situation was pre-conventional. Stage one, punishment orientation. Obedience to authority is always considered. Example, he shouldn't steal a drug because he might get caught and be punished, avoiding punishment. Stage two, pleasure seeking orientation. The action is determined by one's own needs. Example, it won't do him any good to steal a drug because his wife will be dead by the time he gets out of jail. Self-interest. Conventional. Stage three. The good boy or the good girl orientation. The action is determined by the approval of the peer group. So for example, he shouldn't steal a drug because others will think he's a thief. His wife will not want to be saved by something that has been stolen. Therefore, avoiding disapproval. Stage four. Authority orientation. This should uphold the law at all costs and follow the social rules. So for example, although his wife needs the drug, he shouldn't steal or break the law to get it. His wife's condition doesn't justify stealing. Traditional morality of authority. Okay, in the post-conventional, stage five, the social contract orientation. The rules are open to question, but they are upheld for the good of the community. He shouldn't steal. So example, he shouldn't steal the drug. The pharmacist response is unfair, but mutual respect for the rights of society have to be maintained. Social contract. In six, stage six, morality of individual principles. There's a high value that's placed on justice, dignity, and quality. So the example should be, he should steal the drug, but alert the authorities that he's done it. He'll have to face the penalty but it will save a human life. Self-chosen ethical principles. So in summary, Kohlberg estimated that the preventional level is the most common among young children and delinquents. The conventional level of moral reasoning most common in older children and most adults. The post-conventional morality is only achieved in approximately 20% of adults. Very interesting. 
some reflective thoughts before we end this session. 10 moral values for children that I consider. Respect. Respect plays an important role in all our lives, regardless of the age or your social status. Remember that. Family. Gives children a sense of family, community, and they'll grow up respecting and loving their family. Adjusting and compromising. Not everything revolves around them and it must be taught to them to adjust and compromise. Helping mentally. Teach to help others to be a functional part of society and be empathetic. Respecting religion. Respect your own religion, respect their religion, but also understand that every person has the right to choose their religion. Justice. Must always be encouraged to speak up when they perceive something's wrong, for their own benefit or for the benefit of others. Be honest and trustworthy. Never harm anyone. Don't be a thief. Theft is wrong no matter what the justification. It may not be legally, but morally also. Cultivate love for education. Knowledge is power. Okay, that's it. Thanks again. If you found this session of any benefit, as previously, check out some of the other Learn Shops. There are quite a few.